My hands trembled within the bulky, thermally insulated gloves. Not from the chill. The environment suit took care of that. No, the tremors sprang from the sheer audacity of where I stood. Triton, the greatest of Neptune's moons. Across the fractured plains of ice, our base camp gleamed like a chrome beetle under the faint, distant sun. Its modular design, all interlocking spheres and pressurized tubes, seemed laughably small against the yawning vastness of space. I should have felt pride, triumph even. After all, I was part of the first sustainable human colony on a Neptunian satellite. Neptune's children, the media dubbed us. My boots crunched on the crystalline surface, each step carrying me further from the relative safety of base camp. Routine maintenance, they said, checking seismic sensors implanted along the great ice fissures. Necessary, yes, but it always put me on edge. Triton wasn't like home. The thin atmosphere shrieked with a mournful keen on the rare occasions I stepped outside, the sky an eternal bruise where the distant sun barely registered. And the cold, it didn't just seep into you, it burrowed, seeking out the warmth at your core. Today, that familiar dread had a sharper edge. Reports crackled over the comms, anomalous readings buried beneath kilometers of ice. The lead scientists were frenzied, a controlled chaos swirling within base camp. I was no scientist, just a glorified technician. But even I understood the magnitude. Nothing in Triton's geology should cause readings like that. Henderson, my supervisor's voice, tight with barely suppressed excitement, broke through my reverie. You're closest to the disturbance. Head to the coordinates we're transmitting. Just observe for now. Understood? The tremor in my hands intensified. This was beyond routine. This was potentially rewriting textbooks. I reached the designated spot, a deceptively ordinary stretch of cratered ice. The seismic sensor jutted from the surface, a forlorn sentinel wreathed in an eerie frost. The readings it beamed back made my stomach churn. A rhythm within the chaos, a pattern too distinct to be the groans of a shifting glacier. It pulsed beneath my feet, a heartbeat in the frozen desolation. Henderson! Report! Hesitantly, I knelt, the ice like tempered glass beneath my reinforced gloves. At first, all I saw was my own distorted reflections staring back, eyes wide within the helmet. That's when the ice shifted. A subtle bulge. A shape. I scrambled back. In the distorted ice below, it had looked humanoid. A flash of movement, a pale form writhing just below the surface. Then, as quickly as it appeared, it vanished, leaving the ice pristine and mocking in its stillness. My breaths fogged the inside of my helmet. What I had seen, it couldn't be real. Ice playing tricks on my eyes, the relentless cold warping my perception, a hallucination born from isolation. Henderson! My supervisor again, his voice nearly snapping with urgency. Respond, damn it! I keyed the transmitter, swallowed hard, and forced the words out. Something's under the ice! It... I think I saw something moving! The comms crackled with a pregnant silence, then, finally, the resigned sigh of my supervisor. Return to base camp, Henderson. We're sending a full team to investigate. I barely registered anything on the long walk back. With each crunch of my boots, I felt eyes on me from beneath the implacable ice, a creeping certainty that something impossibly strange was stirring on this distant, frozen moon. Back inside the pressurized haven of base camp, the air felt stifling, in contrast to the open desolation outside. The sense of unseen eyes clung to me, and I shuddered, imagining the icy expanse beyond the reinforced walls, a hushed frenzy permeated the central dome. Scientists huddled over hollow displays, their whispers a counterpoint to the usual cacophony of environmental monitors and life support hums. Stevens, the lead exobiologist, paced like a caged animal, his expression showing exhilaration and fear. Henderson, he barked, fixing me with a piercing stare. Details, be precise, be thorough. I recounted the event as clinically as I could, omitting the creeping chill of my imagination. 
The form in the ice, the impossible heartbeat rhythm the sensors detected. Under Stephen's scrutiny, even my own report sounded like the ravings of a man pushed to the edge of sanity. He didn't dismiss me. Instead, there was a glint in his eye, a predatory focus that unnerved me more than outright skepticism. Get suited up, Stevens commanded. You're coming with the excavation team. The next hour passed in a flurry of preparations. The excavation module, a behemoth of reinforced drills and thermal shielding, was prepped for deployment. I was handed a plasma cutter, more for my own peace of mind, I suspected, than actual practicality. We reached the site under the pitiless glare of floodlights that did little to dispel the oppressive gloom. The seismic sensor stood stark, the readings now spiking with a frantic intensity. Stevens barely glanced at it, his gaze fixated on the smooth, bulging expanse of ice. Commence extraction, he ordered, his usually jovial tone replaced by a clipped authority. The module erupted to life, drills grinding and whining as they bit into the frozen surface, sending shards of crystalline ice skittering across the landscape. The rhythmic throb from below intensified with every removed layer. Stevens knelt, pressing a gloved hand against the ice, his eyes closed in concentration. When he looked up, his face was ashen. It's communicating, sending patterns. Of what? Someone asked, their voice taut with fear. Stevens didn't have an answer. I didn't think anyone did. Suddenly, the ice buckled. Not a violent break, but a ripple outwards, a wave of distortion as the form underneath pushed its way towards the surface. Gasps filled the comms channel, laced heavily with dread. It breached with shocking suddenness. A smooth, alabaster hand, disconcertingly human in appearance, burst through the ice. There was no blood, no wound, just an impossible severing of the frozen surface. Then came the figure. Its emergence was not the violent struggle I'd anticipated, but a fluid unfolding, like a swimmer surfacing from unfathomable depths. The proportions were all too familiar, and yet something was subtly off-kilter. The limbs were a shade too long, the joints bending in ways that seemed both beautiful and wrong. Its face! That was the most disturbing part. It was my face. Identical in every line and contour, yet animated with an alien serenity that chilled me to the bone. My doppelganger stood tall. For a long moment it seemed to just observe us, its uncanny replica of my own eyes scanning the floodlights, the excavation module, the fear-struck team. Then it smiled. A collective breath hitched over the comms, a chorus of startled gasps and a few outright curses. The uncanny duplicate, this reflection of myself, remained disconcertingly unfazed. It tilted its head, a gesture almost playful in its mimicry of my own inquisitive habits. Stevens broke the frozen tableau, snapping out of his own disquiet, with a speed that hinted at years spent confronting the unexpected. Henderson, he barked, approach it, slowly, extend your hand. I wanted to protest, to scream that this was madness, but my body was already moving, responding to his command with an ingrained obedience. Every step was an agonizing battle against instinct. My mirrored image watched with an intensity that sent uncomfortable chills down my spine. Ten feet, five. The plasma cutter in my hand felt like a child's toy against the sheer wrongness of the being before me. It maintained that chilling smile, the curve of its lips a perfect mockery of my own. As I closed that final distance, my trembling hand outstretched. The duplicate finally moved. It mirrored my gesture, palm raised, fingers slightly splayed. Something in the motion snagged my attention. Something different. Its nails. Where mine were short and functional, its were impossibly long, tapering to delicate points, each shimmering with an opalescent sheen. It was a detail both subtle and deeply unsettling, like a single stroke of paint that upends the meaning of an entire picture. My outstretched fingers brushed against its cold skin. An electric shock jolted me. 
The smile on my doppelganger's face widened infinitesimally, and I swear, for a horrifying instant, I felt another consciousness brushing against my own. A sharp pain erupted in my palm. I yanked my hand back, staring in horror at the four puncture wounds marring my skin. My doppelganger didn't bleed, but the tips of its long nails glittered ruby red with my blood. Fall back! Stevens's voice boomed with a renewed urgency. Defensive positions now! The research team, roused from their stunned paralysis, scrambled for the weapons lockers. The floodlights swiveled, focusing on the imposter with blinding intensity. It remained unfazed, merely tilting its head again, as if examining the weapons with detached curiosity. Henderson? Stephen said, a note of concern in his voice. Are you injured? I stared down at my wounded hand, the blood stark against the white insulation of the glove. I'm fine, I managed. But something had fundamentally shifted in that single moment of contact. I was no longer simply looking at a copy, but at a threat. The crack of the first energy rifle shattered the tense silence. I flinched as the superheated blast struck my double full in the chest, staggering it. It raised a hand to its scorched torso as though examining the damage, its mirrored smile never faltering. Suddenly, the ice beneath it began to churn, cracks spreading from where it stood. I braced myself for some sort of onslaught, but then it simply sank, descended fluidly back into the depths from which it came. The fissures sealed shut behind it, and in mere seconds the only sign of the encounter was the scorching on the ice. In the aftermath of the encounter, base camp descended into a controlled chaos. Analysis of my blood sample took priority, the medics buzzing with professional concern and a poorly concealed fascination. The rest of the team focused on retrieving data from the cracked and melted seismic sensor, trying to make sense of the energy signatures, the bizarre rhythmic pulse from below. The sense of isolation always present on this distant moon amplified tenfold. We were no longer just explorers on the fringe of human knowledge. We were potential prey stranded in an alien hunting ground. I sought solace in the mechanical routine of base maintenance, the rote tasks a familiar anchor against the swirling storm of unsettling questions. My assigned berth, usually a refuge, felt suffocating. Instead, I found myself drawn to the observation dome, its vast viewport offering a chillingly clear panorama of the ice plains. Every subtle distortion of light on the frozen expanse sent a surge of adrenaline through my veins. I was at once hyper-aware and numb with a creeping dread. Hours passed in this vigil, or perhaps only minutes. Time lost all meaning. With a jolt like icy water down my spine, I realized I was not alone in the dome. Johnson, one of the engineers, stood near the far railing, his usual boisterous presence subdued. His gaze was fixed on the star-speckled blackness beyond the ice plains, as if the answers could somehow be found in that fathomless void. Can't sleep either, I ventured softly. He nodded, a terse motion. Figured the view might be, a uh, calming. He let out a bitter chuckle. Stupid, wasn't it? I leaned against the railing beside him. It's hard to think about rest when there are... I searched for the right word. Duplicates lurking out there. He grunted in agreement. Duplicates, they call them. Makes it sound clinical, manageable. Doesn't feel that way, does it? A flare of light streaked across the inky sky, momentarily distracting us. Meteor shower, Johnson mumbled before turning his attention back to me. Listen, Henderson, that thing, whatever it was, it wasn't you. Not really. Your double... There was something wrong with its eyes. Empty. A haunted look flashed across his face. We need to keep our heads on, Henderson. This ain't some bad dream, we gotta survive it. His words offered a stark dose of reality, a splash of cold water against the creeping terror. He was right. We couldn't afford fear, not yet. We had to understand these creatures, find their weaknesses, or die on the unforgiving ice of Triton. Johnson's words lingered in the air like frozen smoke. We couldn't hide. We couldn't run. 
All we could do was brace for the next strike and hope survival was still on the table. The reinforcements Stevens wrangled from Earth wouldn't arrive for weeks. We became prisoners in our own outpost, the sense of claustrophobia compounding the existential dread. Containment specialists pored over the data, designing traps, barriers and protocols based on the scant information we had. Every creak of the base, every shift in wind direction became triggers for adrenaline fueled panic, followed quickly by shame at our own skittishness. We were soldiers preparing for an enemy we barely understood. Patrols went out, not to explore, but to fortify. Motion sensors were sowed like metallic seeds, each ping on the network a potential harbinger of doom. I volunteered for the engineering teams, desperate to keep my hands busy, my mind focused on the tangible problems. The tensile strength of the energy shields, the calibration of the long-range scanners. Yet all the while, my eyes were drawn to the ice, to the vast, blank expanse that might be hiding anything. One night, after a gruelling shift reinforcing the perimeter barriers, I found myself drawn back to the observation dome. Inside, a solitary figure stood silhouetted against the icy panorama. Dr. Ellis, one of the lead exobiologists. Under normal circumstances, he'd have been holed up in his lab, enthralled with the mystery. Instead, there was a slumped defeat in his posture, a stark contrast to his usual boundless enthusiasm. Can't stop looking, can you? His voice was thick with exhaustion. Waiting, I admitted, joining him by the viewport. For the next one, or the next hundred. He nodded. We focused so keenly on what was out there. He motioned towards the stars. All the wonders and dangers of the cosmos. Turns out, the real threat was waiting right beneath our feet. Silence descended, punctuated by the rhythmic thrum of the base's life support. After a while, Ellis spoke again. What really scares me, Henderson, is that they're intelligent. They're learning. He pointed with a trembling finger towards a subtle indentation on the ice sheet, something I hadn't noticed before. See that? Looks like a handprint, doesn't it? I examined the mark closely. It was undeniably similar to the shape a human hand would make. They're mimicking us, I realized with a jolt of horror. Ellis nodded. First, it was just the one. Now these handprints, they're all over. Getting closer to the base with every passing day. He slumped against the railing, his gaze now fixated on the lights of the base below. The containment teams. It feels like delaying the inevitable. We're not building a prison, Henderson. We're digging our own grave. Dr. Ellis's words sank into me like those impossibly long limbs of the creatures beneath the ice. We were on the clock, a clock ticking down not just to the next attack, but to our inevitable extinction. Something had to change, a shift from defence to offence, but I was just a technician, not a strategist. Surely there must be something. I began, but the words faltered in the face of his bleak expression. Ellis cut me off. Look, Henderson, I appreciate the optimism, but there's no cavalry charging over the horizon. No magic solution buried in our data logs. Just us and the things patiently waiting for us to slip up. His brutal honesty ignited a spark within me. But we can't just sit here and wait to die, I retorted, my voice rising. He met me with a somber stare. Then what, Henderson? What's the brilliant plan that's going to save us all? The truth was, I didn't have one. Not yet. But something about his challenge stirred a stubbornness in me. An image flashed in my mind my wounded hand, the long nails glistening with my blood. We bled. They didn't. We may not know what they are, but they're biological, I said slowly, the thought crystallizing as I spoke, which means they have weaknesses, and we're going to find them. Ellis watched me, a glimmer of intrigue replacing the resignation in his eyes. And how exactly do you propose we do that? We go hunting, I replied the words feeling both foolhardy and inevitable. Not just patrols, an expedition deep into their territory, into the fissures. We find a specimen and we bring it back. He hesitated. The instinct towards scientific curiosity clashing with the very real danger. You realise this? 
specimen won't exactly be a willing lab rat. So we take precautions, containment units, restraints. I gestured helplessly around me. We make do. It's a risk, yes, but a bigger risk than doing nothing. Ellis rubbed a tired hand across his stubbled face. Finally, he sighed. Henderson, you're either recklessly brave or out of your damn mind. Possibly both. A reluctant grin tugged at my lips. It felt like the first genuine expression in days. Let's go with reckless then, shall we? I held out my hand to him. We'll need the best and brightest minds on this. Starting with yours, Dr. Ellis. To my surprise, he shook my hand, his grip surprisingly firm. Don't get your hopes up, he grumbled, but the edge in his voice had softened. We'll likely get ourselves killed in the process. Selling our outlandish plan to Stevens was, surprisingly, the easiest part. The man thrived on adrenaline and impossible odds, his usual caution overridden by the desperation of our situation. Assembling the strike team, on the other hand, was a different beast entirely. Base camp buzzed with nervous energy as word of the expedition spread. Some balked at the idea, calling it suicide. Others, hardened by the constant threat, saw it as a chance to strike back, to finally take the fight to the enemy. It was this hardened group that formed the core of our team. Johnson, surprisingly, was the first to volunteer, his eyes burning with quiet intensity. Dr. Ellis recruited the biologists and chemists we'd need for specimen analysis, and more importantly, the development of potential poisons or toxins. We retrofitted one of the heavy-duty drilling modules into a mobile containment tank, a crude cage on treads. The engineers worked relentlessly to arm us with repurposed mining lasers, untested on organic beings, but better than going in unarmed. I was tasked with preparing the expedition suits, adding layers of thermal insulation and equipping them with experimental sonic emitters. A gamble based on my untested theory that our duplicates might possess heightened auditory sensitivity. Every modification was a throw of the dice, based on fragmented observations and wild theories cobbled together in the relentless daylight of Triton. On the night before departure, I found myself once again at the viewport of the observation dome. Fear was a constant companion now, a low-level hum beneath the adrenaline. We were going into the lion's den, yes, but we wouldn't go in blind. Henderson. Stevens's voice broke my restless reverie. He clapped a heavy hand on my shoulder. Ready for tomorrow? Honesty demanded a resounding no, but I forced my face into a semblance of composure. As ready as we'll ever be. He nodded, doubt clouding his usual boisterous confidence. Look, about Ellis, I know it was a gamble, bringing the exobiology team along. We need them. I cut him off firmly. Whatever those things are, understanding them is the only way we'll ever beat them. Stevens gave me a long, scrutinizing look then grunted in reluctant agreement. Don't let me down, Henderson. We're all counting on you and your crazy ideas. I squared my shoulders. Yes, sir. It was a promise, not just to him, but to myself. A promise fueled by the memory of the handprints in the ice drawing ever closer. The morning brought a brutal clarity, the weak dawn washing the plains in pale, unforgiving light. Our convoy rumbled out onto the vast expanse, the containment rig, two support rovers bristling with jerry-rigged weaponry, and us, technicians, scientists and soldiers, bundled against the cold, clutching our repurposed tools. It felt less like a scientific expedition and more like a doomed charge into the unknown. But as I looked around at the hardened faces of my companions, an unexpected surge of camaraderie warmed me more than any thermal suit ever could. We were the defiant ones, the ones who refused to be hunted. We followed the network of cryptic handprints into a treacherous maze of fissures, the once smooth expanse of ice giving way to a shattered landscape. The convoy inched forward, its bulk in stark contrast to the jagged, claustrophobic terrain. The whine of the engines, our laboured breathing, and the crunch of ice under the tank treads created a soundtrack of intrusion. It felt like we were not hunters seeking their prey, but rather the loud, clumsy guests, 
crashing a deadly silent party. Stevens led the convoy, his hunched form silhouetted against the viewport of the lead rover. My sonic emitter charged at full blast. If my theory was correct, it would be agony for the creatures, but also a beacon. The deeper we ventured, the more intense the feeling of being watched became. The handprints were everywhere now, some overlapping in unnerving clusters, the finger impressions impossibly deep. Johnson, his face creased with worry, leaned over, practically shouting over the noise of the convoy. We need to slow down. It feels like we're walking right into an ambush. Ambush implies they're waiting for us, Dr. Ellis retorted, his voice tight. For all we know, they're curious, observing. The comment offered little comfort. The fissures grew narrower, forcing the convoy into a single line. I gripped my mining blaster, my knuckles white on the grip. Every turn, every twist of the icy canyon revealed new possibilities for attack, from above, below, or burrowing through the walls themselves. The convoy lurched to an abrupt halt. Up ahead, Stephen stood frozen, one arm outstretched in a signal to stop. I followed his gaze and felt a jolt of cold terror. The fissure ended in a sheer, glistening wall, a translucent curtain of frozen matter. I recognised it instantly from seismic readouts. This was the heart of their subterranean network, their hive. And within that icy wall shadows moved, not just one but dozens. Silhouettes distorted and warped by the frozen barrier, but unmistakably humanoid. Still, they were incomplete. The joints, the proportions, subtly wrong in a way that sent shivers through me despite the suit's insulation. Comms, Stevens hissed, his voice carrying the cold authority of a seasoned leader. Keep them open, but not a single unnecessary sound. Prepare containment protocols and weapons. Henderson, he said, his gaze boring into mine. You and your sonic emitters are our first line of defense. Don't fail me. I shifted my grip on the cumbersome emitter, my gaze fixed on those writhing shadows, and whispered, I won't. A touch on my arm. Dr. Ellis held out a small metal contraption, crude and hastily built. Hypothetical biotoxin, he murmured. If we manage to trap one, inject this. Might not kill it, but it should slow it down, buy us time. As I took the device, the ice wall rippled. A single, impossibly white and smooth hand pressed against the frozen barrier, the nails sharp and tapered against the translucent backdrop. The convoy tensed as one, weapons humming into readiness. Then it withdrew, but I knew it was not a retreat, it was an invitation. A grim council of war convened amidst the ice. Stevens made the only logical, albeit terrifying, call. We go in, he declared his gaze sweeping the anxious faces surrounding him. One of those creatures surfaced, which means there's a way out on the other side. We find that passage, set the trap near it, lure one in and... His voice trailed off, leaving the rest to our imaginations. Dr. Ellis raised a cautionary hand. Assuming we can even isolate a single target. And what if this passage leads deeper into their hive? We're out of options, Ellis. Stevens countered, a hard edge entering his tone. We either gamble now on our terms, or wait for them to breach the base and choose the battlefield for us. An unsettling silence fell, broken only by the low hiss of oxygen recyclers. The plan reeked of desperation, born from the cold realisation that we were cornered prey turning the tables, at least in theory. We were done hiding done waiting to be picked off one by one. The drilling module rumbled forward, its reinforced nose aimed at the translucent ice wall. Dr. Ellis and two biologists trailed behind, their bulky forms laden with containment gear, monitoring equipment and the hastily developed tranquilizers. They were the most vulnerable and, arguably, the most valuable of us all. I took position with Johnson and three soldiers at the designated ambush point, a narrow crevice further along what we hoped was an exit tunnel. Sonic emitters thrummed in our hands, 
the discordant wail bouncing off the walls. The wait was unbearable, each frozen minute dragging into an eternity. Suddenly the wall vibrated as something slammed into it from the other side, sending hairline cracks spiderwebbing across the surface. Then again, and again, the rhythm erratic and probing. We tensed, weapons raised. On the other side, those writhing shadows thrashed with increased fervor. I caught glimpses of spindly limbs, impossibly pale, lashing out against the frozen barrier between us. With a crack, a hand pierced through the ice, fully formed now, disturbing in its imitation of the human form. Then another and another, grasping frantically, seeking purchase on the slick surface. Hold steady! Stephen's strained voice crackled over the comms, and just when I thought I couldn't bear the tension any longer, the drill broke through. The effect was immediate. The hands retracted and the shadows behind the wall retreated, leaving only an eerie stillness. We moved at Stevens's barked command. It was a clumsy, panic-driven dash as we hauled the containment unit into position, then scrambled into our ambush points, hearts pounding in unison. Every crunch of our boots seemed deafening in the sudden hush within the tunnel. The waiting was agony. Then, a ripple on the surface of the newly formed ice hole, followed by a pale, sleek shape surging upward, squeezing itself through effortlessly. Just as its torso cleared the opening, the containment field snapped into place, trapping it in a cylindrical force field. The creature slammed into the invisible barrier, grasping wildly, a sound escaping its throat, a sound horrific in its mangled mimicry of human distress. Yet its eyes, those empty black orbs that had haunted Ellis, were filled with cold rage. Our captive thrashed and snarled within the containment field, a caged animal radiating a fury that cut through our initial elation. Watching it struggle, I realized our plan had made a fatal assumption, that these creatures operated with a survival instinct we could understand. The rest of its kind reacted, but not in the way we'd anticipated. Shadows surged toward the hole, not in a frenzied rescue attempt, but with methodical precision. Hands, a chilling multitude of them, stretched from the shadowy depths, grasping at the edges, probing for weaknesses in the tunnel itself. They weren't trying to free their comrade. They were widening the breach. Fall back! Stevens's order was a harsh crackle over comms. To the ambush! They're dismantling the tunnel! In our panicked retreat, I caught a glimpse of Dr. Ellis, his face ashen. He was frantically gesturing at our captive, not with triumph, but with dawning, horrified comprehension. We barely had time to take position in our crevice. The ice was splintering, showering us with shards. The creature in the containment field, seemingly forgotten, had gone still, its predatory gaze locked on the chaos at the opening. Then, with terrifying speed, it moved forward, not at the force field barrier, but the side wall of its prison. Its nails ripped into the gleaming energy with a sound like scratching a chalkboard, amplified a hundredfold. The barrier wavered, faltered, then went dark. Before the creature could unleash its victory cry, I fired. The wave from the sonic emitter struck it full force. It recoiled, those horrifying black eyes widening an instant before it crumpled, writhing silently. Almost as one, the figures froze. Then, in a wave of seamless coordination, they reversed, melting backwards into the darkness beneath the ice. Silence descended, broken only by the frantic beeping of Dr. Ellis's monitoring equipment. What in the hell just happened? Johnson gritted out, his eyes wide. Stevens, his usual bravado shaken, stared at the now inert containment field. Ellis? He finally barked. Talk to me. The biologist seemed rooted to the spot, staring at our unconscious captive as if seeing it for the first time. They're not individuals, he choked out. That thing! It wasn't fighting for its own survival! It was a distraction! A hive mind, Stevens murmured. We didn't just capture a specimen, we poked the damn nest. The implications hit me like a blast of arctic wind. Our plan had backfired. These creatures were not just predatory, they were terrifyingly intelligent, playing us with brutal precision. 
The thought of what they could do with that intelligence chilled me far more than the unrelenting cold of Triton ever had. The comms crackled, breaking our horrified trance. Base camp to expedition team. Massive seismic activity detected originating from your location. I repeat, massive seismic act. The transmission abruptly cut off. We turned toward the direction of base camp. A tremor, more powerful than any we'd felt before, shook the ground beneath our feet, and within me, the cold certainty bloomed. We'd done more than just poke the nest. We had awakened it. Panic was a vicious animal. The raw, atavistic urge to flee surged in my veins as the ice buckled and groaned. The fissures around us widened, the blue ice seeming to writhe with the tremors reverberating through the planet's core. Stevens, though shaken, clung to his role as commander. To the convoy. If base camp is compromised, those treads are our only chance of survival. The rovers were hardly built for speed, and the shattered maze of ice was a death trap on wheels. But as the ground beneath our feet seemed intent on swallowing us whole, any movement felt better than standing as targets for whatever horror was rising from the depths. The scramble back was a series of violent jolts and jerks as the convoy navigated the chaotic terrain. Through the viewports, flashes of pale, twisted forms flashed amidst the swirling chaos. They moved with an impossible fluidity, leaping chasms and scaling frozen cliffs like monstrous spiders, their focus locked onto our lumbering vehicles. They're herding us, Johnson gasped, his knuckle-white grip on the steering wheel betraying his fear. Cutting off any escape route but back towards the opening. His words were a death knell. Ahead, where the tunnel had been, a monstrous, irregular dome of ice bulged, growing at a horrifying pace. It was a blister upon the moon's surface, twitching with the frenzied activity within. Stevens's voice was choked as he keyed the comms. Henderson, that sonic emitter, does it have a wide area setting? My mind raced. The emitters were designed for focused blasts, meant to overwhelm sensory input, not cover a wide swathe of terrain. But if we modulated the pulse, the discordant wave, it just might work. It was insane, reckless, and our only remaining option. I can try, I yelled back, fumbling with the emitter's control panel. The first wave of attackers hit as I worked, their pale forms leaping from the shadows. Our lasers spat bursts of superheated energy against their relentless onslaught. Henderson! Hurry! Johnson screamed, swerving to avoid a hand that shattered through the rover's windshield. Then the modulation locked into place. I aimed the emitter toward the dome, toward the epicenter of the enemy swarm, and squeezed the trigger. A dissonant wail, less focused, but amplified tenfold, ripped through the icy canyon. The effect was immediate and horrifying. The creatures recoiled, clutching at their ears, proof that our theory of their heightened auditory sensitivity was devastatingly correct. It bought us precious moments. We blasted past the epicenter, the convoy rattling and screeching under the onslaught, but miraculously intact. The creatures did not give chase. Instead, they swarmed back onto the dome, their movement frantic and purposeful. The structure throbbed, growing, expanding like a tumour. Comms, Stephen said, his voice grim. Try base camp again, anyone. Silence. Then a crackling burst of static and a single panicked word. Evacuate! Then the signal died completely. As we rumbled, a monstrous, chittering keen rose from dome. I glanced back and felt a surge of despair. The dome structure was cracking, peeling back like the skin of some rotten fruit. The thing that birthed itself from the ice was impossibly massive, dwarfing the human scale its smaller brethren had mimicked. Legs like twisted tree trunks scrabbled for purchase, while a multi-faceted head, all glinting black eyes and gnashing teeth unfurled towards the sky. And with a final crack, the creature tore itself free, a leviathan of the deep thrust into a world far too small for its horrifying existence. In the shadow of the rising leviathan, the last vestiges of our defiance dwindled, replaced by a primal, soul-deep terror. The convoy was a metal beetle scurrying before an unimaginable horror, and we were the helpless morsels within. 
Stevens, his usual confidence shattered, slumped in the command seat. It's over. Gods have mercy. It's over. Even the ever-resilient Johnson seemed hollowed out, his hands shaking on the steering wheel. Dr. Ellis stared numbly through the viewport, the meticulous scientist in him replaced by a man confronted with the terrifying, inevitable finality of existence. But amid that despair, a cold spark of fury ignited within me. No, I choked out, my voice raw. We won't die like this, cowering, hunted, not after everything. In the rearview mirror, the Leviathan's shadow stretched across the ice, gaining ground with every stride. But up ahead, something else caught my eye. A smudge against the stark horizon. The emergency evacuation shuttles. Our last chance. The escape shuttles! My thoughts stumbled over each other. We have to lead it away. Buy them time to launch. Stephen stared at me as if I'd lost my mind. Henderson! We're dead either way. That... that thing will... We give them a chance! I yelled, a desperate energy surging through me. We give everyone else a chance! Johnson, to my surprise, met my gaze. There was fear in his eyes, but also a hint of that defiant spirit I'd seen on the first day. He's right, he declared in a surprisingly steady voice. Better to go down fighting than rolled over like damn bugs. Stevens hesitated. Then the ghost of his old command resurfaced. Fine. You suicidal idiots want to be heroes. Be my guest. He keyed the comms, his voice regaining a semblance of authority. All rovers, break formation. Target the Leviathan. Distract it. Slow it down. By the evac team's time. God, help us all. Our lumbering convoy split each rover a pitifully insignificant metal box defying the impossible. I gripped the sonic emitter with sweaty hands, the bulky unit feeling impossibly frail against the ancient horror bearing down on us. We attacked like insects buzzing around a giant. Lasers seared the creature's chitinous hide, drawing little more than irritated twitches of its massive form. My emitter shrieked, its dissonant wave crashing against it like an angry ocean against an unyielding cliff. The Leviathan seemed mildly confused at first, but its movements didn't slow. Then Johnson, in a flash of reckless brilliance, swerved his rover directly into the monster's path. At the last second, he bailed, leaving the vehicle to slam into the massive leg. The impact carried through the landscape but did little more than slightly shift the Leviathan's trajectory. The sacrifice bought us a few precious seconds. I could see the shuttles now, rising like fireflies against the backdrop. One, two, three of them, tearing into the upper atmosphere. The Leviathan cried out, its fury a physical assault on our senses. Its focus narrowed, locking onto us, the buzzing annoyances. With terrifying speed, its legs propelled it toward what remained of our convoy. I watched as the first rover was crushed, its occupants not even having time to scream. Johnson nudged me, a grim smile playing on his lips. Guess it's our turn, eh? Before I could reply, he gunned the engine, sending us careening directly into the creature's path. The last thing I saw was the Leviathan's enormous mouth, wide enough to swallow me whole before the world exploded into darkness. And as the Leviathan relentlessly hunted down the remnants of our convoy, a surge of bittersweet relief came over me. The escape shuttles were gone, pinpricks of light vanishing into the vastness of space. In my final moments, I clung to the image of those receding lights, not knowing whether they would ultimately find safety, but convinced our sacrifice hadn't been in vain. We had given them a fighting chance. Our deaths here on the ice had bought them precious time. It was a brutal equation, but it was all we had left. Hope in this impossible situation wasn't the certainty of survival, but the belief that our actions might have tipped the scales however slightly in favour of those fleeing this unforgiving moon.